Did you bring a Bible with you? That wasn't real convincing. How many have a real Bible? I don't want to, I don't want to see any glowing Bibles right now. I mean, <laughs> uh, if you got a real Bible, you got a better chance of getting into heaven. That's, that's, um, that's what they say. So whether your Bible is glowing or it is genuine leather, would you pull it out? Find me two places, please find John chapter 20 and John chapter one, John chapter 20 and John chapter one. Today, we start a new series called selected pictures. And I'm gonna explain that in just a moment. But for the next 21 weeks, we're going to go through this book of John. I'm really excited about this. And uh, today's sermon is going to kind of serve as the foundation as we get ready to embark through this amazing book of John. Um, don't get me wrong. Although it will be the foundation, we're going to certainly jump into the scriptures and we're going to set our eyes on Jesus and we're going to be pointed to him today. But I do want this to sort of set as an introduction for where we're going to go over the next 21 weeks. And for those that perhaps are not familiar with the scriptures, let me just give you a little bit of context. I like to say it like this, that text without context is a con. Um, so it's really important to understand what we're reading, because if you don't understand the context, you'll make it say whatever you want it to say. But the original writer had a purpose in writing it. So we need to understand what that purpose is. So by way of context, the book of John is one of four New Testament books that is referred to as a gospel. You got the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the four gospels. And if you were here on Easter, we talked a little bit about that word gospel and what it means. It's a declaration of good news. So these first four books of the New Testament, they're a declaration. They're a proclamation of the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. They tell us the story of Jesus. Now of these four gospels, as important and as inspired as they all are, there is just something really unique and special about the book of John. I would even maybe say it like this, that if there's only one book in all the world that you could kind of get your hands on your eyes on and your ears on to figure out and understand who Jesus is, I would say drop every other book and grab the book of John. This is just a really unique and special book. And by way of background, uh, John is one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. I'm diving even a little deeper than that. He was one of Jesus's inner circle. Jesus had the 12, but then he also had the three, Peter, James, and John. And most scholars, as they do their, their work studying the life of John, they will all agree that John was the best friend of, of Jesus. This is actually evidence that Jesus is at the end of his earthly ministry, at the end of his life. He's hanging on a cross, atoning for the sin of the world. And one of the last things that Jesus says is he's there on the cross. He addresses it to John, which by the way, John was the only of the 12 disciples to be there at the crucifixion. And Jesus is up on the cross and he says to John, John, I want you to take care of my mom. John, you are going to be responsible for caring for Mary. So needless to say, Jesus and John have a very special relationship. They are very close friends. As a matter of fact, John five different times throughout this book is going to revert to himself in the third person. He gives himself a moniker. He gives himself a, a title. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved quite the title. Now that's not to say Jesus didn't love the other disciples. Of, of course he did. This is just John's way of saying that, Hey, if I had one title, if I had one description to be summed up by it's this. I am loved by Jesus. And with that in mind, John takes pen to parchment and he begins to write out his eyewitness account of the three plus years that he spent living and walking with this God, man, Jesus. And of the four gospels, again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John, John is going to be the last one to record his eyewitness account. And his eyewitness account is actually going to be different from the previous three, not, not, going against it. Just, just different. For example, John is only going to record seven of the miracles that Jesus did. Whereas you look at books like Mark or, or Luke, Mark will record 18 of Jesus's miracles. Luke will record 16 of Jesus's miracles. John will not record any of the parables of Jesus. Whereas the other gospel writers record all of the parables of Jesus. And, and again, this is not to be contrary or to tell a different story than the other gospels. Rather, John writes with a different 
purpose. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. But the term that theologians use to explain John's type of writing, they say his gospel is non-synoptic, meaning it doesn't follow the pattern or the same theme that the previous gospel writers use. And again, there's a reason for this. Let's jump into church history for a moment, if we could. History tells us that because of his faith and because of his unrelenting hold on the truth of the resurrection of Jesus, John was actually exiled to the island of Patmos. But when the Roman emperor Domitian, the one that exiled him, when Domitian dies, John was allowed to come back to the city of Ephesus. And I want you, if you could, to use your sanctified imaginations. I want you to kind of picture this in your mind. But John finds himself now in the city of Ephesus. He's up in age. He's an old man in his late 80s or his early 90s. He's, he's got gray hair. He probably has a really long white beard. And he's the last remaining of the original 12 disciples. And everywhere John goes, every time he's at church or in the synagogue, whether he's in the pews or he's walking the streets, everywhere he goes, he's constantly being stopped by people because everybody wants to hear the stories. Everybody wants to hear them. Keep in mind, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already all written their gospel accounts. So people are familiar with the stories, but now they want to hear them again, this time from the last remaining eyewitness. And the people stop him and say, John, John, tell us about that time that Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. John, John, tell us about that time where, where Jesus walked on the water and then calmed the storm with just a word. They say, John, tell us about that time that Jesus took a Hebrew happy meal and he fed 5,000 people with it. <laughs> they want to hear the stories. And time after time, John gets stopped and he gets asked about all the things Jesus did, about the miracles and the teachings and the parables. And I think something begins to burn within John. Not that the miracles and the teachings of Jesus aren't important. They, they certainly are. But John knows that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have, have already covered those things. So now he sets about writing for a different purpose. And John writes not to address the things that Jesus did, but rather, John writes to let us know who Jesus is. You see, John had walked and lived alongside Jesus. And at that time, he was just a young man. But now, John, he's up in age. He's had a lifetime to, to reflect on and to think about all of those things in life that perhaps had slipped away from him that he didn't remember or that he didn't notice in the moments of his youth. Those things that he saw Jesus do, those things that he heard Jesus teach that needed time to develop. And John now, as the last remaining disciple, he sits, he sits and he puts pen to paper to let us know who Jesus really was and is. In church, listen to me. If we, can, if we can capture this, if we can truly understand what he's writing, it will change our life. And that's not just a preacher using hyperbole. I'm telling you, it will change us in this life and it will change us for the life to come. Uh, how'd you find John chapter 20? I, I want us to start there. John chapter 20. We're, we're going to get to chapter one in just a moment, but I feel like we need to start at the end before we get to the beginning, because it's here that John tells us in his own words why he wrote the gospel. John chapter 20, verse number 30. John writes and he says this, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John writes and he says, Hey, let me tell you why I wrote this book. Let me tell you why you're about to study this book. I've written it so that you may believe. So that you may believe, believe what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. Now this word believe that we see here, it's an important word. It's an important theme that's going to reoccur a number of times throughout the next 21 chapters. As a matter of fact, John uses this word 98 times in 21 chapters. I think he's trying to get a point across. John wants his readers to believe that Jesus is in fact the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the son of God come to earth and that Jesus is the savior of the world. And John says this, that if you'll believe that you'll have life through his name. 
and not just any kind of life, eternal life. Sozo, it's the life of God. That's the Greek word, sozo. You'll have the life of God. And he's not just talking about the life of God or eternal life that comes after we die. He's talking about eternal life and experiencing it right now. He's letting us know that light and life have broken into the darkness and that you're going to either live in the light or you're going to live in the darkness. It's one or the other, but it's certainly not both. You'll either live in light or you'll live in darkness. And by the way, over the next 21 chapters, we'll see this theme occur over and over again, light and dark. And John, again, as he's making these references, he's not talking so much about what Jesus did, his miracles and his teachings. He's trying to teach us who Jesus is. And in order to do that, he gives us a few snapshots, a few selected pictures, if you will. Let, let me refer you back to verse number 30. John says this, these were written. These are written that you may believe. Well, John, what, what are, what are these? These are 21 selected pictures that I have recorded with the express purpose being that if you will believe them, you'll come to this unshakable conclusion that Jesus is in fact the son of God. And that through believing in him, you'll experience life in his name. So this is why we've called this series selected pictures. Because over the next 21 weeks, we're going to make our way chapter by chapter, looking at these different pictures, this amazing gospel of John. And we're going to let these pictures reveal to us the person of Jesus. We're going to let them reveal to us that Jesus, he was not just a good man, not just a good teacher, not just a good example for us to follow in this life, but rather that Jesus is, in fact, the son of God and the savior of the world. So this morning, we're going to look at our first selected picture. I had you find John chapter one. Now let's go back to the beginning, John chapter one. And what I want to do is read to us the first 18 verses of this first chapter. And I know some people go, Oh my gosh, 18 verses. That's so much to cover. Listen, um, these 18 verses are meant to be read together. They're put together on purpose. When John initially set with, with pen and paper, he penned these together. As a matter of fact, the, the early church, they actually set music and melody to these first 18 verses so they could be easily memorized and sung and spoken by believers. So what we're about to read is really important. It's the prologue. It's the introduction that sets up the rest of the book. And then one final note of context before we read, John is going to start his gospel and the story of Jesus very differently than the other gospel writers in Matthew and in Luke, we see the story of Jesus begin with him as a baby being born in Bethlehem's manger. Then we read the, the gospel of Mark, which by the way is the apostle Peter's eyewitness account, but Mark writes and he doesn't have time for, for baby Jesus. He starts with grown, you know, adult, you know, hair on his chest, Jesus being baptized in the Jordan river. But then we get to John. And John takes us in a completely different direction. And unlike the other gospel accounts, John says, if you truly want to understand the story of Jesus and who he is, then you've got to go all the way back to the beginning. And he uses these highly intentional words. He uses this highly structured poetic language that connects Jesus back to the, the Hebrew Bible, back to the old Testament and connects Jesus to God himself. Look at how John describes Jesus. He says it like this, John chapter one in verse number one. He says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Now just pause there for a second. When he mentions John here, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about John the Baptist, John the baptizer. Verse number eight, he says this, John was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Verse nine, the true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And in verse 14, I love this verse and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
and we've seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who's at the Father's side, but he has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God for it. Let, let's pray and then uh, we'll dive into this. Holy Spirit, we come in awe of your word. And we ask that you would illuminate that word to us now. Holy Spirit, give us fresh revelation. Help us to see Jesus anew. Help us to see him in his beauty and in his glory. Help us to see him as a son of God and as the savior of the world. We need your help. So would you illuminate your word to us today? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So when it comes to the subject of doctrine and or theology, the, these verses that we've just read might very well be the most important group of verses in the Bible. Uh, without exaggeration, we could spend all 21 weeks of this series right here in verses 1 through 18 and never run out of stuff to talk about. Um, so needless to say, I've got the task <laughs> ahead of me. I've got far more to cover than I have time to cover it. And so what I want to do uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit is just kind of highlight for us a couple of really important themes that John uses to set up the rest of his gospel. I, I want to think about this passage and introduce this passage to you, to you like this. Maybe get us thinking in terms of a movie trailer. These first 18 verses, they, they kind of work like a, a movie trailer. They, they set up the rest of the gospel for us. Now, I don't know how many of you like going to the movies. How many of you like going to the movies? All right, it's one of my favorite, favorite pastimes. Mind you, there's not been a, a good movie in the movie theaters in a hot minute. Um, <laughs> but I love, I love going to the movies. Uh, I love going with my wife and us having date night at the movies. However, uh, my wife views movie viewership very differently than I do. Now, if you're anything like me, you like to arrive to the theater about 15 minutes before the movie starts. Right? You can find your parking, you can get in, get your popcorn, get your drink, get your snack, whatever you need, use the restroom, and then go and find your seat. I, I love being there on time. It was drilled into me from the time I was a kid that if you're five minutes early, you're actually late. So I'm that guy, I like getting there early. But more than being there on time, I'm there because I don't want to miss the previews. Seriously, like if I miss the previews, I don't even want to see the movie. I like them just as much as the movie, if not more. However, my wife, bless her heart. <laughs> if the movie starts at seven o'clock, she's like, oh, we got all kind of time. And she doesn't want to show up until about 7.30. <laughs> Often we take separate cars there because I just cannot stand for this. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the seat, I'm watching the previews. The movie's about to start. We're two minutes into the movie. Here comes my wife walking down the, the, the side aisle, the big smile on her face, sits down. And then she has the gall, the audacity, and the nerve to look at me and be like, hey, what did I miss? <laughs> like, you missed everything. You know, like. <laughs> but listen, I, I never miss the previews because it's the previews that get you excited about coming to the movies again. Right, like, 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 just think about this logically. The reason you're actually sitting there in the theater at that moment is because you probably saw a movie trailer for the movie you're about to see. And it got you so excited, you decided you were going to pay the price of admission and the convenience fee. That's not very convenient at all. <laughs> it's the movie trailer. It's the preview that gets you excited. And the reason I, I bring that up is because these first 18 verses that we've just read, they act like a preview to the movie that John is about to show us. He shows us all the things in these 18 verses in this preview that we need to be looking out for as we embark throughout the rest of the gospel. In other words, John is giving us a first glance at all the important themes that he eventually wants to cover in detail. He's hinting at these things. He's dropping seeds that are eventually going to blossom as we study and as we read this book. And the first thing that John wants to draw our attention to is that blended together He's put all of these Old Testament images for our consumption. 
Now, this is really, really important. John's doing it on purpose. He's pulling from Old Testament themes and ideas, and he puts them all together in these first 18 verses. And the reason he does it from the outset is because he wants us to know that Jesus is the reality to which all of these images, which the Old Testament storyline point to. You, you probably noticed it when we read, but John uses terms. He uses descriptions from the Old Testament, like God's word, God's life, God's light, God's son, God's glory, God's law. And every one of these descriptive terms, they're pictures and they're symbols that his audience would have been familiar with. And these pictures and symbols given to us in the Old Testament actually point us to the character and the nature of who God is. And what we have to understand is that from the outset, John is letting us know, hey, Jesus is actually not just the fulfillment of these things. But rather, all of these Old Testament images, whether it's God's word, God's life, God's lot, uh, 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 law, son, or glory, all these things, they don't just point to Jesus. Rather, he is and he's always been the reality of these things. Does that, does that make sense? So as we read, we've got to keep in mind, John is incredibly intentional with his word choice. He's highly intentional about the terms that he has Chosen. Remember, he's setting the rest of the book up for us. We're going to see these themes over and over again throughout the next 21 weeks. So here's what I want to do. I want to just highlight a couple of the ones that we read today, a couple of these themes. And I want to perhaps break them down and give us something to consider so that hopefully by the time we, we leave here in 18 minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> they will walk away through the power of the Holy Spirit with a greater understanding of the person of Jesus. Let me take you back to the text. Let's go to the beginning, verse number one. John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, John, again, highly intentional. He uses this phrase, in the beginning. Have you ever heard that expression before? Right, he's taking us back to creation. He's taking us back to the first words of the Old Testament, Genesis Chapter one in verse one and every one of his readers would have known exactly what he was trying to do. Genesis one, one in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So John is connecting us back to creation. And then what he does, he introduces us to this person called the word. Now, it's important to understand John is not saying that when the beginning or when creation happened, then the word came into being. The word then came along. No, he's actually letting us know that when the beginning happened, the word was already there. And by the way, spoiler alert, um, the word, this person that John's referring to is Jesus. Cheat sheet for you. You could go ahead and write that in your Bible. The word is Jesus. And in essence, what John is saying is going, hey, guys. I'm taking you back to creation because there's a little bit more to the story here than perhaps you initially thought. He says, in the beginning was the, the word, the word. This is the Greek word logos. And it's a multifaceted word. It, it, it's a multifaceted concept and, and idea. So today, for the sake of time, the best and the simplest definition I can give you is this. It literally can be translated living expression. Jesus is the living expression of God. In the beginning was the word, the living expression. Now, again, remember, John is pulling from an Old Testament theme here. And the first place that we see this living expression, this word, this logos of God in the Old Testament is in creation, right? In the beginning was the word, or in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. What did God do? He began to speak. He said, let there be light. And the light bulb turned on. The first place we see God's living expression, this word in the Old Testament is in creation. That's why John is pulling us back there. But now as we step into the New Testament, John is inviting us to understand and take part in a new reality, in a, in a new mystery. He's giving us a unique view of God. He's saying Jesus is the eternal and creative word, the Logos made visible, that Jesus is the divine living self-expression of God. And not to jump too far ahead, but if you were to go down to verse 14, John makes it real simple. He says it like this, that the word Jesus was made flesh. In other words, all that God is, his living expression got sewn up into human fabric, into human flesh in the person of Jesus. Uh, are you tracking with me? Does that make sense? Okay. Now this descriptor, the, the word that John uses, 
We're going to see this term over and over again. It's the terminology that John uses in reference to Jesus. And for the next 18 verses, he lists out different attributes and expressions of the word. And each of these expressions, each of these characteristics of the word gives us an insight into the person of Jesus. And I want to just highlight a couple of these things for us. Here's the first thing that we learn about Jesus, the word. Number one, we learn that he's eternal. He's eternal. Notice what John says. In the beginning was the word. Now that word beginning literally is in reference to eternity past. We can't think linearly when it comes to time in this regard. John is not talking about a date on the calendar. You see, we, we, we live and we operate within this construct called time and it's very linear, but God is not contained within the construct of time. As a matter of fact, time is a construct God created. Time is a construct he created to show us how good he is. He exists outside of time. And so when John references in the beginning, he's referring to eternity past Jesus. He's eternal. And I know that that's a hard concept for us to wrap our, our brains around, but he's saying, look, Jesus was never created. He's always been that before there was a beginning, Jesus was already there, that he has no start date. If he has no start date, he's going to have no end date that Jesus is forever and eternally existed. And, and we hear that. And a lot of us go like, well, okay, but where did he come from then? Where did God come from? I, I like how pastor S M Lockridge explains this subject. The reason God came from nowhere, pastor Lockridge would say God came from nowhere. And the reason God came from nowhere is because there wasn't anywhere from him to come from and coming from nowhere. God stood on nothing because there was nothing for him to stand on and standing on nothing. He reached out where there was nowhere to reach and he caught something where there was nothing to catch. And then he, took that something and he hung it on nothing and he told it to stay there and nobody said a word about it because there wasn't anybody there to say anything. <laughs> so God decided to say to himself, mm, that's good. <laughs> that's a creative way of saying Jesus. He's eternal. He's always been. So Jesus, the word he's, eternal. He's always been, he always will be. But number two, John lets us know Jesus is not just eternal, but Jesus is actually also God. N notice again, the verse in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Like that middle sentence, John can't be any clearer in making his point. He literally says the word was God. The word was God. Jesus is God. But then he takes us a layer deeper. He says, not only is Jesus God, but he's also distinct from God, right? He uses this word with the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. This is John's way of introducing us and giving us insight into the triune nature of our God. Please understand. He's not saying we serve multiple gods, but rather our God is one God eternally existent in three distinct persons. God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit. And I know that this topic of the Trinity can be a little bit confusing. It's hard to comprehend. Um, and you hear different people use different examples and different illustrations to, to describe the Trinity. One of the examples I hear most often people say, well, the Trinity, it kind of is like water and, and I get it. The illustration though is not complete. They, they say it like this, that, that, that water can exist in three separate states, right? Liquid gas and solid. But all three of them are water. It's just three unique, separate expressions. Now, again, I, I understand what they're saying. I, I get that picture. And to some degree, it's, it's helpful. But here's where that illustration falls short. Water, yes, can have three separate expressions, but water can't be all three expressions at the same time. You understand what I'm saying? So, so just like water has these three separate expressions. Yes, we do serve a triune God, three unique separate expressions, yet they all have and will forever exist at the same time. Let me take you a little deeper. If John were a, a math teacher, which is a scary thought, but if John were a math teacher, he might give us an equation to understand the Trinity like this one plus one plus one equals, and we go, Oh, we get that one three. That's easy to wrap our, our mind around, right? Right. Three unique separate gods. One plus one plus one equals three. But John goes, no, 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 not quite. 
Let me invite you into a new mystery. Let me invite you into a new reality. It's not one plus one equals three, but rather one plus one equals one, right? One father, one son, one Holy Spirit equals one God. This is the truth that he's trying to communicate to us. A triune God, one God eternally existed in three separate persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And by the way, we're going to see the Holy Spirit show up in, in, in a few verses later on in this chapter. But in verses one and two, John is specifically referencing God the Father and God the Son. Jesus, the Word, he's telling us, is God the Son. And in the original language, when John writes and says the Word was with God, that, that word with it can actually be translated face to face. He was face to face with God. Again, painting this picture of two distinct persons, father and son. Yet Jesus is distinct from the father, yet one with him. It's an incredible mystery. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul later on in the New Testament would pick up on this, this reference and he would write in Colossians chapter one, he would say like this, that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, that he's the exact representation of who God is and what God is like. Again, distinct from the father, yet one in the same with the father. So John says, Hey, number one, Jesus, the word he's eternal. And number two, he's God. And then the third insight he gives us is this, that Jesus, he's creator. Look at verse number three. If you got your Bible, John writes, he says, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, a very simple and absolute statement here. There's no way of mistaking what John is saying. He's saying Jesus, the word is the creator of all things. All things were made through him by his power and for his glory. And without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus, he's creator. But not only that, look in verse number four and five. John says, I want to teach you a little bit more about the word. He says in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So John introduces us to a couple new images here, life and light. And he's telling us, Hey, when it comes to life, Jesus, the word, he's the source of life, not, not just biological life, but, but the very principle of life itself is found contained within the word contained within who Jesus is. And that life was the light of men encompassing both spiritual light and natural light. Now keep in mind, John's not saying that the word merely contains life and light. He's saying Jesus, the word is life. And he is light. And, and that's the fourth insight that he gives us into the person of who Jesus is, that the word he's eternal. He's God. He's creator. Number four, Jesus, he's the source of life and light. And if that's true, let me give you a very simple and direct observation. If Jesus is in fact life and light and a person does not know Jesus, then there is a very real sense in which that person is dead and in darkness. And isn't it interesting how instinctively we as humans, we are afraid of the dark and we are afraid of death. And John's writing and he's letting us know, Hey guys, now in Jesus, you have an answer to these things. You have an alternative to these fears. You no longer have to be afraid of the dark or of death. No, notice what he says. Verse number five, he says the light again, referencing Jesus, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. I love that. I take such hope and encouragement from that statement for a couple of reasons. Number one, I take encouragement because it tells us that Jesus has all power and that Jesus is undefeated, right? It doesn't matter how dark things get. It doesn't matter how dangerous or uncertain things are in this world. Jesus, the light, he shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome him. I find great encouragement in that. I don't know about you. Things are getting pretty dark around here these days especially in an election cycle. But no matter how dark things get, King Jesus is forever victorious. King Jesus is forever on the throne. The darkness has never and will never overcome him. Here's the second encouragement I get from this statement. Number two, I get encouragement because Jesus isn't afraid to show up in the darkest parts of my life. Right? Look what John says. He says the light, it shines where in the darkness, in the darkness. 
Listen, some of you have kids. Some of you have loved ones that um, are far from God right now. And if you were to describe their life, you might say they're living in the midst of darkness. Their lives are filled with confusion. Listen, I'm telling you, Jesus, the light, he specializes in showing up and shining and revealing himself in the darkest places of our lives. You are not too far gone. Your kids are not too far gone. The light of Christ shines in the darkness and it brings light. It brings life. I love this phrase. John says to all who will receive him. If you got your Bible, drop down to verse number 12, verse 12 and 13. Tell us this in great detail. And, and truthfully, my, my time is running short. So I want to jump ahead and just kind of end here today. Verse number 12, John says this, but to all who did receive him, received that life and that light, received the eternal creator. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now this reveals to us the final insight we're going to look at today. John is saying this, that Jesus He's savior. He's eternal. He's God. He's creator. He's life. He's light, but he's also savior. Look again what the verse says, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How? Through a new birth. And John says that this new birth is not the result of human doing, right? They weren't born, not of blood, nor of the, the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. This is not a biological birth. This is not because your parents wanted it to happen. This new birth that makes us a child of God, it's of a spiritual nature. Now, now some people will argue, well, isn't everybody a child of God? Well, there's a sense in which that is true, right? We're all created by God. Therefore, in that sense, we are the children of God. But that's not what John's talking about here. No, John's talking about something completely different. And, and honestly, the rest of the New Testament will echo this. When John talks about becoming a child of God, he's talking about it in the sense that you do not become a child of God until you consciously receive. That's a big word. Consciously receive Jesus and put your faith in him as Savior. And really what this is, what receiving him all is all about. Look in verse 12, look what it says. But to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believed. There's that word again. Those that believed 98 times in 21 chapters. This is what receiving is. This is how I receive this new birth by believing in his name. John is letting us know that salvation or spiritual rebirth, it's available, but it only comes through the vehicle of believing in the name of of Jesus. And he's about to give us an invitation on how to receive it. And what I love about this is that this invitation to a new birth is the same today as it was 2000 years ago. It has not changed. The answer in the vehicle is still the same. You must believe in, you must put your faith in, you must rely completely and totally upon Jesus and what he's done for us. Someone goes, well, what is it that Jesus has done for us? I'll tell you, John tells us verse 14, the word Jesus, he became flesh. And he dwelt among us. So how does that even apply? Well, what does that mean? It means this, that Jesus, the second person of the triune God, the eternal creator, the son of God condescended, put on flesh and blood, became human and stepped into his creation. The creator stepped into his creation. Remember, nothing was made that was made outside of him. He created the world. Yet he condescended, put on flesh and he moved into the neighborhood. Why did he do that? He did it to rescue you and to rescue me, to rescue humanity from sin. It's a word you don't hear talked about very much anymore. Sin, rebellion, death. Humanity had rebelled against its creator, rebelled against God. And the easiest thing in the world would have been for God to discard us and start over afresh, but he didn't. He put on flesh the living expression and he stepped into his creation. He stepped into his creation to rescue us from sin and from death. And to understand this, John says, you've got to go back to the beginning. You've got to go back to that creation account. 
right? We know the story. God creates the world. He creates man and woman. He creates them in his image. They walk and talk and have perfect harmony and fellowship with their creator. Things are the way they were always intended to be. They're good. They're right. They're wholesome. It's a beautiful picture. And God says, Hey, look, you have dominion over all of creation, except for one thing. I claim exclusive right to one thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, God is saying to them, he's saying to humanity, Hey, I get to be the one that determines what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. You don't get to choose that. I do. God says, if you disobey that, if you step out from underneath my authority and you eat of the tree that I told you not to in that day that you, you will surely die. And in the original language, we know this, we've studied it. That word die is actually there twice. You will die, die. You'll die a double death. You'll die physically and you'll die spiritually. You see God's initial creation. Nothing was ever supposed to die. Nothing was ever supposed to wear out or become old. It was forever supposed to be new and fresh in its existence. But we know the story, don't we? The enemy of old, the serpent, the devil is the same enemy enemy we have today. He calls into question the very thing that God had said to them. He says, really in the day you eat, you will surely not die. But God's trying to hold you back. If you eat of this tree, you're actually going to become like him. Your eyes are going to be open. You'll get to determine what's right and what's wrong. And Adam and Eve, the fountainhead of the human race were deceived and they ate of the tree. They stepped out from underneath God's authority. And the Bible says when they did that sin entered the world and on the tail of that came death. What does sin do? Yeah, it brings death, but it also brings separation. You can read the account. Adam and Eve, they, they eat of the fruit of the tree. Their eyes are open. The Bible says, and immediately out of fear, because they realized they had done something wrong. They went and they hid themselves. They had walked and talked in perfect harmony with God, the father, with the creator, but now they're hiding. Why? Because of sin. Sin separates and sin brings death. In the New Testament, we learn in, in the book of Romans that the wages of sin, what we earn because of sin, it's, it's death. And as Adam and Eve are the fountainhead of the human race, now we are all born into the state of spiritual separation from God. The apostle Paul will say it like this, you were dead in your sins and in your trespasses, cut off from the life of God. And because God is holy, because he's just and because he's righteous, he cannot overlook sin. He must because of his eternal righteousness, balance the scales. The punishment for sin must be met and because God's holy and he's just, he couldn't overlook our sin, but because God is love and with his great love with which he loved us, he could not overlook us. And so he made a way where there was no way. And the Bible says that in the fullness of time, God, the father sent his only son into the world to rescue us from sin. That's what John's saying in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus, the eternal creator, the word of God came to earth. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He gave the world a perfect expression and revelation of who the father is. And the reason Jesus can reveal God is because Jesus is God. He's the visible image of the invisible God. But even as we read today, Jesus, the word, Jesus, the true light, he came into the world, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Even more than that, they crucified him. They murdered the son of God. Go, well, why would they do that? Well, John actually lets us know in chapter three, verse number 19, he says it like this. This is the judgment. The light Jesus has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. You ever been asleep, sound asleep in your dark room and then your parents come in and turn on the light? It's startling, right? It hurts the eyes. Jesus put on flesh and the light moved into the darkness, turned on the lights and it exposed our evil deeds and we didn't like that. So we crucified him. We crucified the son of God. And you would think it was a sad ending to a tragic story, but 
It's actually part of God's master plan all along. From the beginning in eternity past, God knew what he was going to do. And Jesus came to this earth and he laid down his life. And I highlight that he laid down his life. Yes, he was crucified, but no one took his life from him. He laid down his life willingly and in so doing became the payment and the atonement for our sin. Again, the wages of sin is death. Jesus took that death upon himself to balance out the scales of God's eternal justice. Second Corinthians 5 21, God made Jesus who knew no sin to actually be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the message of the gospel that John's trying to communicate that Jesus was crucified, that he died, he was buried. And then on the third day, he was raised back to life. And John says, look, if you will put your faith in Jesus, if you will believe in his name, what he's done for you in his coming, his dying and his resurrection, if you will receive him, you'll find life. In his name, you become a child of God, this spiritual rebirth. This is why Christians are called born again believers, because we've gone from death to life. This is the invitation that John gave his readers 2000 years ago. And it's the same invitation I'm giving you today. Will you receive Jesus? Jesus, who is eternal. Jesus, who is God. Jesus, who is the creator, Jesus, who not only brings life and light, but is light and life. And will you believe in his name, Jesus, the savior of the world? He gives life to all who will receive him. Come on, let's pray together this morning. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We acknowledge that it's living, breathing and active that those same words that you inspired John to write 2000 years ago can speak to us and into our reality today. And Father, as the message of the gospel has been preached this morning, I pray now that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would make it come alive in human hearts. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would go to work doing what I cannot do, revealing to hearts their need for a savior, I've done my very best and I'm grateful you used the foolishness of preaching, but Holy Spirit, I ask that supernaturally you'd begin to speak to human hearts now. Reveal their need for a savior. Convict hearts of sin, I pray. Reveal the deep need and longing to be known by their creator. And Holy Spirit, I pray as well as you convict hearts that you would convince hearts. Convince hearts that although their sin is great, there's a great savior whose name is Jesus, that if they will put their faith, if they will put their trust, if they will put their reliance upon him, he will save them. He will save them from their sins. That he will save them from death. Holy Spirit, I can't do that. But I ask that you would do it now. And for every heart that cries out for salvation, Holy Spirit, I thank you for applying salvation to their life, pouring out God's love into their heart, changing them from the inside out. As the apostle Paul would say, making them a new creation in Christ Jesus, where all the old is gone and everything becomes new. Even as John would write that we read today, that they would become children of God, that their status would change, no longer slaves to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your supernatural work, Holy Spirit. Thank you for moving in our midst. Oh, we love you in this place. We love you in this place.